Okay, this is for the beginning for um, our legislative branch unit in our book. It's chapter 11. You will see there are three sections for this. Um, historically, I say that this is the most important, if we're saying chapter from the book, uh, material. And the reason being is the fact that the legislative branch is what our founding fathers were originally based upon. Again, what did they envision with it? On there that um, they knew what they wanted. Article 1 is half of the Constitution. On there, when we are doing the worksheet in class with Article 1, I, I wait until now to do, do this. Um, our framers, and again, the difference between framers and um, founding fathers, the framers are the people that were with the Constitution on um, there, mainly Madison, Hamilton, Jay, and those groups that were working with that and there. But there, historically, the legislative branch has been the most, most important. Um, I brought up the question in class today, is what about in the last 50 years, okay? Um, is the legislative branch the most powerful? Uh, most people say today it's not a lot because of the gridlock. We have not had a dynamic president like a Teddy Roosevelt or something like that, that the executive branch took the forefront. A lot of people say today that that it may be even the Supreme Court since the 1960s um, there. So this is where they're really, we haven't had one branch that's dominated for decades like we have at certain times in our, our history um, there. Okay, this the next couple sections, a lot of this is review over what we had in both chapter one and chapter two and our government basics and we had our pass fail quiz on that. Representatives, according to the Constitution, have to be 25 years old, represent the state that, um, that they live in. There, they have to be a citizen for at least seven years. Senators, 30 years old, citizen for at least nine years, also have to resident, be a resident of that state. The terms are different, and that's on purpose, and this is where we always think, why? Why did the framers make representative two years terms and senators six years terms? The entire 435 representatives are all up for re-election every two years, but only a third are in the Senate, which later on we'll see that term continuous body that we've had multiple times. Um, and according to the Constitution, every state has to have at least one representative. Florida, we currently have 27. When the results of the, of the 2020 census are done, we will have one or two added um, there. And I'm not sure right now what we'll have um, there. Remember the Great Compromise, where we had for the framers, why they had it. Think back to where, where like a bill comes to law, it has to pass both the House and the Senate. Um, when we get to that section, that one of the things we kind of look at is, is to kill bills. Our framers wanted to make sure that they had ways to stop anything. So the House of Representatives, if there's something that states with large populations don't like, they can stop it there. And in the Senate, states that have small populations can stop it there. Um, going back for our elections, this is where we have for an incumbent advantage, which we had in our behaviors unit, but now where a lot of our elections we seem to focus on the president, but you need to actually look and see for the representatives. Where, why do they have a, a, an advantage when they are running for re-election? The number one thing is rain, name recognition. Uh, we know Daniel Webster, where Dana Cottrell's run against him the last two times. People don't know her. This part for casework, where we had a little before, but we'll have again a, a review, a quick review of it again. Constituent services, um, the College Board likes to call it casework. But if you have a problems on the federal government, you give it to Daniel Webster. So you're having trouble getting a passport or a problem with the IRS, and then has made their case. So if they do work for you to help you solve a problem they can't solve, people remember that and now they helped in there. Usually people look back, unless there's something controversial on there, they don't know most of the votes that their legislators make, but that is where, where they think back. And uh, Daniel Webster, for the past 20 years, if you live in the villages, it's been 20 years, um, he's been representing and voting the way they'd like. Um, the media attention, they get more, they're more visible, they can bring home the bacon, which we'll have later on with pork barrel politics, where I will have about bringing a moped museum to Inverness um, as a represent for, for the bill. Well, this is where if they're able to bring back something like that, that other taxpayers actually pay, and that's called pork on um, there. They have more money, PACs are supporting them, more advertised, they usually have more experience, not always, but they have this. And usually, unless there's some reason that, um, unusual, they normally have a weak opponent if they're an incumbent. And going back to our election, what are the reasons um, the incumbents lose when they do? It's usually a scandal. 
okay, um, there, that they have something like that that they're fighting on a scandal. Other reasons might be like a midterm or off year um, wave, or there are some reason that, that you have for on the coattails of a, of a candidate. Here's where showing the, the, the newcomers. We're actually not even complete yet with all the recounts for 2020. You'll notice that the biggest changes usually are in the midterm or off year um, years. It ha um, one thing that I was pointing out in class in here, um, the, where 2018 election, we had a large number of Democratic women. You notice there weren't too many newcomers that are, are, are women for the Republicans. But 2020 was, was different because the Republicans actually, most a, a large percentage of their newcomers were women, which the House of Representatives in the past four years has had a dramatic change um, in the number of women um, that are serving, both Republicans and Democrats, between 2018 and 2020 elections that we have. All right, some terms you need to know here. Session, that has period of time with Congress symbols, conducts business, at the end they adjourn. Um, this goes into to when we have the bill comes from a law because a president can do a pocket veto if they adjourn. This does not happen a whole lot now because what normally ends up happening is they don't actually adjourn, they will go on recess um, there. But if they do adjourn and they go home, for, um, like in the past, they would go for a couple months, they would adjourn and then come back next year. But if the president needs something, he does have a power with the checks and balances to, to call a special session. We also have, if Congress isn't leaving, the president has the power of prorogue um, there when they can't decide when to leave. leave. Um, that has never been done. Some people look at that and say that could be an abuse of power. Could the president just end Congress when he wants anyways um, there? For voting, this is a side to just be more familiar with, but the one word you do need to make sure you know of, when much Mr. Smith goes to Washington, you will see quorum, but you have to have a certain number of people to conduct business. If you're in a club, you're supposed to have that. Can't just have one or two people show up and you all decide, oh, here's everything official. Now, how is voting done? One is way that you have it where people go through and you just tell, tell um, the clerk yay or nay for the vote. A voice count is where you go and all in favor, stand up, say yay, all in post, say nay, and it's basically just a, a simple thing, usually done with resolutions. A division, you actually stand up and they count to see with this. A roll call vote, this is usually when it's something big or monumental, um, and there for the House, you have to have 20% of the House request it, and each person has to individually go um, where literally they roll call and you call it. Sometimes they want to put a person on a spot or for a major bill, they do it this way. The way most things are done since the 1970s is you see the picture there, you have a card and then you can vote and then you vote either yay, nay or present. Reason why you have presence. Sometimes a person doesn't want to vote on one way or another. Maybe it's controversial or they feel like they need to recuse themselves for personal reasons. Um, there, but they don't want to be seen as absent because if you run for re-election, you don't want to be the person that has the worst attendance and was, was if, let's say, you missed 47 of the last 200 votes, okay, that is something that's a negative that you have. Um, here's a tweet from before about when they started the electronic vo voting um, there. So, All right. This is actually your AP side, where the other side is kind of what, what happens with the voting. This is the side that you really need to know. This is a repeat AP theme that, that you have. How should they vote in there? Um, and not yay, nay, but should they vote by the way their constituents wants or by their own meaning? There are vocabulary words you need to know. If you vote in a delegate matter, you vote the way that your constituents are. So you believe ABC, but the majority of the people in your district believe XYZ you're going to vote by X, Y, Z because that's what your constituents wants. The opposite of that is a trustee. You vote A, B, C because you feel that's what is best. That's a risky thing to do politically on there. Senators can do that a lot more than representatives because you, if you're a representative, you may have the backlash of in re-election of that. Senators can do that especially early in that six year term because people forget it. Now, the in-between of this is Politico. And this will be a good example of where Daniel Webster, um, here for our representative, he will be a politico. There are some issues that he will be a delegate. When it comes to an issues of Medicare or Veterans Affairs um, or Social Security, um, the military, issues in this area with a high percentage of retirees, 
um, and military vets, he will definitely vote the way his constituents wants, even if it costs more money and he says he's a fiscal conservative. Meanwhile, if there's some sort of issue um, that we have that people in this area don't care about, he'll be more of a trustee. Notice it looks like politician with politico or politics. Um, again, this is a repeat idea that is done on, on AP exams um, there for the writing in here. Also, when a person's voting, they have to, to, to weigh in the party. We'll come back to that when we go for the hierarchy and how whips and what they do with log rolling and those things. So we have in there just kind of a, a review of for the for the chapter one and chapter two. Our legislative branch is bicameral. We have two houses. Our constitution, because of the Great Compromise, did that. Bill comes to law again to make sure that it passes both the House and the Senate. Big states can stop it in one, small states in the other. Our Senate, once again, six-year terms, they're staggered. That makes it a continuous body. Again, why our Constitution wanted for that? The House of Representatives, we can, we can even though it wouldn't happen, we, um, it could actually have all 435 switch over in one election. The Senate's supposed to be long-term and supposed to be looking, looking long-term, so that's why you cannot change out the entire Senate um, in one election. It takes three different elections to have it. Midterm elections or off-year elections are the congressional elections that occur in non-presidential years. And what's been a repeat theme um, here is that the party opposite the president is the one that usually do does the best. Um, if history serves right, 2022 will actually favor the Republicans on there. That does not mean that it will be. There's other factors. Um, that, that you have, but historically you usually have that, especially in the sixth year um, in their second term of a, of a president. Uh, there. All right, who do they represent? It's constituencies, the people in interest. My look at interest, say what? What are they? Not interest groups. This is where, what are things? So Daniel Webster, yes, he represents the people. We have a large percentage of retirees, so that's a part of it. But what are major businesses in this area? We don't have much industry. But we do have um, in there, and someone in class yesterday had said, said, well, he represents manatees. Kind of saying jokingly, but yes, he does, because Citrus Hernando County with the rivers, we have a lot of ecotourism. So actually, he does represent the manatees because that brings people here in economics. With our retirees, some of our most important businesses are construction and medical. So those are interests that they're going to be on it. The franking, franking privilege is something that you just have to know what it is and, I, and I, what a Frank is. If you see on this letter, you will see um, there Richard Nugent, who was our former representative, and there. If you sign it, they can send out something that's official business. Um, this is something that is an advantage that the incumbents have for a simple fact that they, they're they able to send out um, letters of what they're supposedly doing um, for business. I remember when this one was sent to me from Richard Nugent, it was a letter just saying that he had co-sponsored a bill that was to try to do and make stricter punishment for inter internet scams um, that are targeting retirees. This area, that was an important thing uh, for us. So here's this letter, but he was also running for re-election in the near future. So that's where I have this. Should congressmen have the franking privilege in today's society? It's a question that we have. Should they be able to do it? Richard Nugent, as, as representatives, would spend a lot of money um, using the Frank for things that, yes, it's official business, but it's also some of this that, that is a, a gray area for what they're used for. All right, this term, the constituent services in there, again, the college board calls the case where what representatives and senators are doing to help them. It's usually representatives in there. They have a staff. Um, that some of them are in, Do in Washington, D.C., some of them are in home districts. For the Senate, they're scattered about um, in here. Again, you help with something for, uh, that you have with, if you have a problem. Like if, uh, my, if my parents have a problem with Social Security or Medicare, they're able to go to their representative. If I want a flag that flew over the Capitol, we go to Daniel Webster. That's what the Environmental Academy did um, there. If you're trying to get into to one of the academies, this is where it's a constituent service that you have. So those are things that if you have a problem, you go to your representative, the staff will help you out. Again, a lot of times called casework because it is your case that they have. All right, now for this part, this is an important thing that we have. This is where for our projects that we have, kind of think of this for how a bill comes to law. 
on there that, that our framers set things up to stop something from becoming a law. There's, there's so many ways that a, that a bill dies. Go back and think back to the old schoolhouse rock um, and hear you, what you had in your seventh grade at, um, civics class. We're going to have, though, even more than what you had then. First thing you need to know is a bill can be, be um, written by anybody. So, yes, you can write it. But it will not be introduced except for by a representative in the House or a senator in the Senate. So Donald Trump or Joe Biden, they can write a bill, but they have to have someone to introduce. They got a few more friends in Washington to help them out than maybe you. But let's say you write a bill and, and then Daniel Webster, um, Representative Webster, then goes it. It can be co-sponsored by other legislators if they agree with it. It's going to be given a, a number um, in a House, House Bill 26, Senate Bill 24, something like that. Key thing to remember, if it involves tax or taxes, which is revenue money coming in, and there, it's supposed to be introduced into the House of Representatives first on um, there. That is actually a key thing. It's one of the few powers the House has over the Senate. Once a bill is introduced on there, the Congressional Budget Office, which is not partisan, they will go and give a cost estimate. So you'll see on the next slide in here where I say about, okay, let's start a, a moped museum in Inverness. Well, if the Congressional Budget Office says it's going to cost $1.4 million to build this and it's going to cost $300,000 a year to run it. So it forecasts the cost of it. The research service tracks where the bill is, what committee it is, and Mr. the Library of Congress also um, here. For the, our U.S. government, there are some areas that, they, that they're not a, as good even as the state of Florida and transparency that they have. But this is where they track the bill. So here's where I'm saying that for our bill. We want a bill. I, I want a moped museum in Inver, Inverness so that Susie has a place to be. And but we go and Daniel Webster then represents, uh, goes and he introduces it into Congress. What happens then? Well, the first thing that happens in the House of Representatives um, there, it is going to be put in a committee. Um, there is a steering committee that will decide what committee it goes into. We have a rules committee in the House um, in here that it goes. And once it goes to committees, then, and this is where I have a lot, a lot of things on here, it will probably in the House go to a subcommittee. So. Once it goes into a subcommittee, there are hearings. Should we have this? Should we spend money on this moped museum? And so different interest groups, and this is the Iron Triangles come in. They're going to come and they're going to say, yes, we need to have this out of there, or no, we don't need to ha have this um, there. There's some people say that, that we're going to, to go and it's gonna cause problems with the environment, or this shows that that, that it'll, it'll help American manufacturing. So they're each gonna come into hearings. The representatives in that committee or subcommittee will do these hearings there. Now, when it's in a subcommittee, they, they can rewrite it. They can completely change it if they wanted to. They can add amendments. They can have an amendment that says um, they're going to have a ball of yarn museum in Kansas that's done. Has nothing to do with this, but that's added on to it um, there. Most bills die in committee. Hey, this is where when the little schoolhouse rock uh, there, he's somebody's dying committee. But if it then gets approved by the committee, it is sent to the whole house or the whole Senate. Now the name you need to know on here, the official name is the committee of the whole will vote on it. So it goes up to the entire house and the committee of the whole votes on that bill um, there. So depending on what happens in, uh, in each one, there's a lot more floor debate in the Senate and the House. A lot of times there's even a gag rule, which the Rules Committee will say you can't even debate it or add amendments. The, uh, there with 435 members, that's why they have this there. Another thing that you can do is put it in multiple committees, and that's what this article was about for an ethics bill in Tallahassee. There, the more bills you have, the more things are going to add to it, and the more that people don't like it um, in here. Um, here. All right, in the House. The first committee it goes through is the rules committee before it's designed to the committee for whatever issue it might be. Like if it's agriculture, they have agricultural committees. If it's armed services, or uh, the, they have the armed services committees for if something's military there. The rules committee does, guess what, guess, decides the rules. Again, they could be saying there's a gag rule where you can't discuss it on the committee of a whole on the floor. They can say that there's no amendments allowed, which is what is called a closed rule. They have those type of things. And the Senate is just the opposite 
Um, and we're going to go more into a filibuster in class where I'll see, we'll see a classic of this and uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. But a filibuster is where any one senator can go and take the floor and pretty much kill a bill by talking it to death. Now, in the old days, they, you actually literally had to go and stand on the floor, and we'll see that on and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Today, that is not the case. Pretty much, you can just say you're going to filibuster, and unless they get cloture, which is 60 of the senators that vote to tell you to sit down and shut up um, there, you don't even have to go and talk it to death. There is debates on whether should, we should end the filibuster or go back to the old rules um, in there. Another tactic you have, which is called a hold, which you have objections in there and you want things investigated um, in there. And it's another way to just basically slow down a bill. So another way to kill a bill. Notice here common cause, our interest group from before. But this is where once the rule was changed in the 70s, where you no longer had to truly physically go with the filibuster, there's been a lot more filibusters that, that we have had. Um, again, there's some talk about ending the filibuster or going back to these rules. Okay, again, bill's introduced. It goes to committee or committees. If it gets sent out, out of the committee, the committee of a whole um, votes on it. And it has to go through the process both in the House and the Senate. Once it gets done and passed them both, it goes to a conference or a conference committee. That must be exactly the same. They will then work out deals. If it's not exactly the same in there, they will make it exactly the same. And then we have a revote. It has to pass then exactly the same. So that's what a conference committee or conference is um, in there. It must pass both floors by majority vote, not 51%, 50% plus one more vote um, there. It is then sent to the president. The president then may, may do several things. He can sign it into law. Usually actually isn't done very often unless it's something big and you see some pictures there, Obama signing of Obamacare, um, Lyndon Johnson signing the Voting Rights Act of 65. So if it's something big that they want to have, let's say, President Trump was one that loved to sign bills. They didn't have many passed, but he always did some sort of signing some ceremony and, and held it up. But most of the bills don't even get that done. If they ignore it and Congress is still in session, it just automatically becomes a law. And that's what actually is the most common thing that, that happens. If Congress has adjourned and that bill was passed in the last 10 days, if they ignore it then, it will become a pocket veto. It will die in that way. Or the president can straight out veto it, which says you cannot, that they don't approve of it. It is not dead yet because then it can be sent back to Congress. And Congress has the ability, if they get two thirds of the House and two thirds of the Senate, to vote it, they can override the president's veto. A lot of times, the president, when he vetoes it, will say, I don't like it because of this. So they'll rewrite the law the way the president wants, or the president can be proactive and even say while the bill's being debated, if you do something on this and here, um, I will veto it. Or if you don't have this in it, I'll veto it. So the president will basically interject his voice into the, the process that we have in here. All right, it's not over yet. Presidents, when they sign it, sometimes they will actually attach a signing statement. President Bush was famous for this. Obama did it also, where they will then go and give their interpretation of the bill on it. Then what's really important that you didn't learn in seventh grade, we had our bill to, that approved what's called the authorization bill for a moped museum, but it's still not going to happen because no money is able to go. There will be yet a whole process again where it'll be part of an appropriations bill, probably be included with a bunch of things. And then in the appropriations bill, they will then go and appropriations means spending. Um, when Watch Mr. Smith comes, goes to Washington, they call it the efficiency bill. But it goes through the same process and it has to be voted and then approved on again. Say, why did our founding fathers have a double, double tier system? It is where, again, they want to find a way to make sure that we don't have frivolous laws that, that are made and we don't spend money, especially on something that way. So, again, more ways to make sure that to stop something along the way. Other vocabulary that, that you have to know, and this will be in our vocabulary um, past fell quiz, pigeonholing. If it gets stuck in a committee, but it, uh, there, um, it can be if enough House members vote for a discharge petition. Very rarely happens for a discharge petition, 
but pigeonholing, a lot of times that's done on purpose. You introduce the bill, you want to make sure you do something that your local people want, but you don't actually want it to pass. You're just doing it to have the, the local voters have it. A rider is another word for an amendment, something that's added. And the rider could have nothing at all to do with the, with the bill. A lot of times for an appropriations bill, if you want to make sure the president doesn't veto something, you add in something that has it for something safety for the military or something like that. That way, if a person either votes against it or the president vetoes it, I'm there, even though it's only one small part, you say, look, you didn't want to protect a military. An omnibus bill or a Christmas tree bill is with bills that have so many different riders on matters that have nothing with it, trying to go and they're passed because everybody gets a little bit something out of it. This is what happens in pork barrel politics. Log rolling, this is where you have it where you do something for someone else um, in here. So um, I, I'm trying to, Dana Webster's trying to get the Moped Museum passed here. He goes to a representative in Kansas that's trying to get a dam built in on um, the Arkansas River. So he will say, listen, I'll vote for yours if you vote for mine. A lot of this is actually done by the whips when we go with the hierarchy. The, the whips will do a lot of the, the log rolling. And the pork earmarks that on there, those are the projects that are usually in riders on there for the pet projects. A uh, moped museum would be that way um, in there, that we would have something that, and the reason why it's called pork, we like it, but other people don't like it in here. We also have a way that are like laws um, in there with resolutions. There are some differences. First of all, we have a simple resolution or a concurrent resolution. Notice both of those do not have the force of law. They are just a statement. They mean nothing other than it's just basically a declaration made in the House. Um, there. So if they decide we're going to make November 30th National Moped Day, all right, all in favor, aye, all opposed, a notion passes, doesn't mean anything um, there. It could be um, in there that you have it where the House of Representatives does a resolution where they are criticizing the president for doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, there. The Senate could turn around if it's a different party and say the president's doing the right thing doing it. Again, they don't mean anything. Concurrent is both the House and Senate make this resolution. Usually it's procedural matters, but it could be something a little bit more important. They want to send a message. Now, the important one is joint resolution. A joint resolution does have the power of law. The main thing about a joint resolution and why you would use it is you cannot go and add amendments to it. You cannot go and, and um, filibuster. So this is a lot of times done, and this is where like the Spanish-American War, um, World War I, World War II, all the declaration of wars were done by joint, joint resolutions um, there. After 9-11, we had one that was passed um, there, giving President Bush more power and War, po war Powers Acts um, idea. What are other things that influence the decision making in here? Well, the president has the bully pulpit. Again, it can say, if you don't add this, I'm going to veto something, or the president can write a bill and have more people supporting it. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen. Uh, president Trump multiple times has said he was going to veto a bill if, um, if it didn't have money for his wall. Congress wouldn't do it even when it was controlled by Republicans. He still signed the bill, didn't veto it um, there. That you have. But this is where you can sometimes use that. President Reagan had that power to be able to say, we need to have this done. And people said, backed up Reagan and Congress, even when it was the Democratic Party, would do it. Party leaders have a huge influence, that whole hierarchy that we have. What's in the platform of the party? Ideologies that we have. The constituents' concerns, if enough constituents are, are writing to congressmen, the grassroots um, effort, that could get something done. Interest groups and PACs and lobbyists all have influence on different issues when they go to those committees and they're doing hearings. The media, what is the agenda making when we go back to where we had our chapter on the media? Um, if, they're, if they're having enough stories about an issue, they'll raise awareness and then it'll cause people to then contact their legislators and say, we need to do this. And obviously, if there's a crisis on something, that makes it where a lot of, pe a lot of things will get done. Some historic questions you have. You notice part of this question is one's from chapter one and two with the direct democracy and Republican form of government. But notice there on D, it describe each of the models of con congressional representation. Trustee, delegate. E, explain why a member of Congress might sometime act as a trustee rather than a delegate. Um, that you have. Here you see for a bill come along, you're not going to have a question how does the bill come along, but they'll take different parts. Like here's a filibuster, House Rules Committee, Conference Committee, 
you have to describe the role for each of those that, that you have um, in it. Notice C, explain how casework affects members' attention to legislation. So if you have a bunch of people that are having problems getting visas or um, passports and they keep going to Representative Webster, he may then introduce a bill to try to make it where it's better. And that's how, like an example of how ca casework can go. But you would have to need, you need to define and describe the whole system that you have.